All right. So um, just a, a few questions before before starting. Um, who here has uh, used Kafka, Apache Kafka? OK. Who here has used uh, Spark? Uh-huh. Um, who here has uh, used uh, Spacey? Of course. And uh, who here has built a machine learning model and, um, you know, uh, and then put it in production? Perfect. I'm sorry for, for your loss, but today we're, we're going to hopefully cover some interesting uh, uh, topics in this area. And uh, we're going to dive in quite a few uh, um, technologies that are going to be covered in this uh, track uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, so it's going to be primarily on uh, real-time machine learning uh, pipelines with Kafka, Spark, and Spacey. Um, a bit about myself, my name is Alejandro Saucedo. I'm based in London. I am leading the research and development at the Institute for Ethical AI and Machine Learning, which is basically a research center that focuses on developing uh, standards and frameworks uh, for the responsible uh, use of machine learning systems. And things uh, involve, uh, for example, explainability tools to interpret black box model predictions. Before that, I have been uh, in leadership roles, building uh, field engineering and machine learning engineering uh, teams and scaling them to uh, deliver projects within financial organizations, insurance companies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And today, we're going to dive into the world of ETL. Um, and conceptually, uh, it's going to be both from the traditional side as well as streaming. Uh, we're going to be covering a very, very high level overview of uh, machine learning fundamentals. Uh, we're going to cover some trade-offs of the existing tools. And then we're going to actually jump into a hands-on example. Um, and you know, as I said, I think that the best way to learn is by doing. So we are going to be fixing the internet today. We're going to tackle hate speech in the internet in one of the uh, nicest websites in the world, which is Reddit. Uh, there is, uh, as they call it, the front page of the internet. So we're going to try to uh, uh, make sure that the front page of the internet is a little bit kinder. Um, in this, we're going to use a data set that involves um, comments that were removed by moderators. Uh, we're going to be using uh, or assuming that there's going to be heavy compute, meaning that data won't fit in memory. Uh, we're going to be using big data and machine learning frameworks. And uh, we're going to be also uh, having requirements for real time, such as alerts. And I'm going to cover uh, much more of that. We're going to answer the question, can we survive another social media chaos? Uh, pretty much, can we get ready for uh, avoiding Trump 2020 or something like that? Um, the data set is basically uh, 200,000 uh, uh, comments. and. 50,000 of them were removed by moderators. All of these comments were from our science. So who here has been on Reddit? Perfect. Nobody here lives under a rock, so it's great. Um, so some comments, as you will see, the data has uh, the usual uh, metadata like upvotes, downvotes, date created, etc. And um, we are going to be uh, interacting with a, a real-time stream. Uh, because I don't trust the internet in conferences, I will be faking this stream. But we will assume it's, it's real-time and you know, the internet works perfectly and you know, the demo gods are always in our side. Uh, you can find the, the slides in the GitHub. Uh, so this is uh, github.com slash A-X-S-A-U-Z-E. Uh, and uh, you will find also some of the templates uh, for the Docker uh, Compose deployments, as well as the Kubernetes deployments um, to go for it. And yeah, let's do this. So batch ETL, let's start with the traditional, more traditional side. Uh, so what is ETL? The way that I put it is how to avoid cron tab hell and you know not end up in this mess, which I'm sure many of you have had nightmares dealing with, you know, both of them. People just copy pasting and putting a cron tab in production. And ETL breaks down into three very simple things that are very well documented in this architectural diagram. Uh, the E stands for extract, uh, which is basically from potential databases, data sources. The T is transform, doing something with that data. And then load is putting that data somewhere else. So it's take data, do something, put it somewhere else, like our expert uh, so, uh, solution architect over there. Uh, there are a lot of variations. There's ETL, there's ELT, there's EL, there's LT. There's many, many different acronyms 
acronyms for this. And the, ba the bad thing of all of these acronyms, you know, extract load, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is that they're all relevant in some context. And that's why it's reflected in such a big soup of tools that, you know, unfortunately, there are some tools that are better than others for some things. Um, and others, others just, you know, are plainly useless, but um, the ones that you would find in the sort of more common set of tools, you know, they all actually serve for a specific subgroup. And we're going to dive into some of those. Uh, for the ETL side, extract, transform, load, there are um, tools like Uzi, which is basically a scheduler for, uh, you know, uh, 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 frameworks like Spark. Uh, you, uh, you often use this when you're dealing with per perhaps data that doesn't fit in memory. Um, it often it, it becomes uh, slightly more clunky, uh, clunkier than if you were using something like, for example, Airflow, but that is because your use case requires it. If your entire stack is already, you know, heavily um, uh, on Hadoop-based infrastructure, then it definitely makes sense to do that. Also, if you have a, a, a data lake uh, within your organization, you know, uh, some of the tools that Apache, uh, the Apache ecosystem provides, makes sense. The the other one is the the lighter but up and coming Airflow. Airflow is prima is, is uh, uh, written primarily in Python. It's also in Apache Incubate and it's the one that I always uh, uh, um, encourage when it comes to workflow management. So if you need a system that is easy to uh, see the uh, overarching uh, jobs that are currently running and you just need it to press buttons in different systems, Airflow is great. Uh, the one thing to bear in mind is that unlike Uzi or uh, uh, Spark, data doesn't go through Airflow. Uh, this is just a very, very high level. For the extract load, you have tools like NiFi and Flume, which basically they tend to get data from one side to the other. Uh, NiFi itself has a very nice uh, UI, but then again, it also dives into a little bit of the transform because you can actually also transform data within. And then for the ELT, you know, you have other area, other tools like Elastic uh, Stack, you know, data warehouses where you take data, load it into the database, and then transformations happen there. But again, you know, all of those are, you know, quite ambiguous. Today, we're going to be using Spark. Um, and we're going to be using, more specifically, uh, Spark Batch Analysis. So this, this uh, uh, piece of code we're going to dive into uh, 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 a bit more in, 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 the, in the actual example. But before that, let's actually jump into streaming. And let's actually talk about batch versus streams and what separates both. Uh, conceptually, the difference is that batch uh, acts on data on a quote unquote scheduled sense. So it would be once an hour, once a day, it would take a specific table or subset of a database, do some something with it and then put it somewhere else. Whereas with streams, you would want to actually uh, uh, process or move the data as it comes. So as every single data point Point appears, you may want to actually uh, add it into another piece of storage, or you may actually want to have some rules that alert a specific team uh, on, on, on uh, a specific sense. However, uh, something that people have seen is that it's not all about batch versus stream. It's often batch and stream. And you often have uh, uh, requirements where perhaps you have a stream of uh, for example, tweets that you you may want to trigger some specific actions if a keyword is trending, but at the same time, you may want to store this in your S3 buckets so that your data scientists can do operations uh, on a on a on a batch basis, right? So you 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 actually may have both uh, uh, um, architectures within and both tools and frameworks within your uh, uh, tool set. And what is more important is that right now there is a very interesting uh, uh, discussion uh, that they call the unify uh, uh, interface into both batch and streams. Because when you think about it, uh, when you are actually processing uh, stream data in real time, that is no different to, well, that is relatively no different to if you were taking an entire file and you were streaming it to process that. Or, for example, if you were going to process a um, specific data set on a window where the window is the entire file, right? So there is an argument where you can actually use the same syntax to process uh, data that is coming in real time, as well as data that is in batch. And this is one of the very interesting areas because a lot of players are trying to tackle that and trying to become the leaders in that space. Uh, tools like uh, you know Spark, Flink, um, Google's Beam project, which is now an Apache uh, a framework, etc., etc. They're all trying to tackle this unified tool set. 
And um, some of the stream processing concepts that I want to cover in a high level is that as you have data coming in in real time, you have different ways of thinking about the computations that happen to that data itself. You know, the, the one that you probably heard in the past is Windows. Perhaps instead of actually doing computations in each single data point that comes in, you may want to actually take the last 10 minutes. And from those last 10 minutes, you may want to actually do some analysis for all that data. Similarly, you may want to have tumbling windows. So every hour, you may have like non-intersecting uh, uh, data and analysis on every single hour. Or alternatively, you can have actually sliding windows where every, uh, um, you know, you have windows of one hour, but it slides every minute. And you you actually have the computation on those uh, set of uh, slides. Um, uh, also, there is this concept of checkpointing. As you have streams, you may want to save the point at which you last read the stream, right? As you have a, for example, tweet stream, you've, you've been uh, streaming that for the last uh, day and a half, and suddenly your your uh, uh, um, uh, Lambda function crashes, you, you may want to actually start from where it left off. So checkpointing basically provides this uh, uh, state stateful um, storage that allows you to say, well, I've read all the way up to here. And then you can actually use your workers to uh, make sure that they can actually start from where, from where they left off. That is, uh, a checkpointing is uh, uh, achieved uh, through different means. Uh, this could be like you handling it yourself and keeping track of what is the exact offset in which your app left, uh, left off, uh, and then start from there. Or you can actually allow uh, applications like Kafka to handle that sort of stuff. And then the last one, which is a very interesting one, is this concept called watermarking. And watermarking basically says, if, for example, you were doing some window computations of one hour, what happens if one data point that should have come within this hour arrived you know, two hours later? You should actually be taking that into consideration, but because it arrived late, you weren't able to actually add it into that window. So what uh, watermarking is, is basically saying, how long should I keep some cache of the data so that if something arrives late, I would also consider it in all the previous uh, computations. And in this case, you can actually see in the x-axis is the, is the event time, the time in which things you know, uh, should actually be coming. And in the y-axis is the processing time, which is when it actually arrived. And watermarking is basically saying, well, I will actually listen to things that may come uh, much later, as opposed to just in this line, which is assuming that everything comes when it should be processed. Um, and, and these three concepts are, you know, some of the most uh, uh, the, 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 the most uh, often uh, referred to uh, in the in the world of, of data streams. Some thoughts on popular tools. Um, if you've jumped into the data streaming world, you may have heard of tools like uh, Flink. So Flink itself is a data uh, processing framework. Uh, the reason why it's become so popular so fast, well, not so fast, it's been there for for quite a while, but so popular is because it's very focused. Uh, all it tries to do is uh, uh, stream processing. And what it has managed to accomplish it, is that it is really good at doing that specific. So when it comes to checkpointing, uh, windows, watermarking, um, uh, Flink provides some of the most mature uh, functionality. Unfortunately, it doesn't have as much of the ecosystem as you would find with other tools. So if you were to, to do, uh, uh, if you wanted to do machine learning, you are uh, dependent on the Flink ML library, which is still in very early stages. Uh, so that's something to consider when actually jumping into this. Another one that is uh, relatively recent is Kafka Streams. So Kafka is a stream processing framework. So it's a stream streaming framework that added recently uh, the ability to process. Uh, again, this is uh, this has a lot of benefits because it allows you to actually use your existing uh, uh, um, uh, streaming uh, pipeline uh, 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 servers to also process the, the um, computations, uh, which is different to adding a new, a whole new tool extra into your ecosystem. Uh, however, you know it's still up and coming, and um, you know as as you would find with a lot of the Apache systems, it's written in Java, so you often cannot benefit from all of the things that other languages give you, like Python or R. Then you have other variations like uh, FOST, which is primarily written in Python. This has actually a lot of uh, concepts that borrowed from Kafka Streams, and it's really interesting to use. Uh, unfortunately, it is um, uh, 
not yet fully production ready, has a lot of bugs, but if you're looking to get started and try something in the streaming uh, context, I recommend you to try it out. Uh, it's it's, it's a really easy to, to get started. And the last one is Apache Beam, which is basically a project that started with Google. It tries to unify the, the, the different interfaces. Uh, it uses backends uh, as opposed to building the entire uh, uh, engines itself. And as backends, it uses uh, Spark for the batch processing and Flink for the stream processing. Um, so uh, this is very, very high level overview of all of, of some of those tools. Today, we're going to actually be using Spark Streaming. And as you as you guessed, Spark Streaming is Spark's uh, contender for the, the, the streaming sphere. A lot of hardcore uh, streaming fans say that Spark Streaming is not real streaming. And you know they do have a point. The reason why is because the way that Spark Streaming works is it acts in uh, batches. So it listens for a period of, for example, in this case, two seconds. And then every two seconds, it sends that uh, uh, um, stream into uh, the Spark engine. So you continuously have that sort of stream. So for some of the people that are um, uh, uh, that say that streaming is only uh, valid when it's fully real time and the computations are per data point, uh, you know, Spark streaming is not yet doing that. However, in their latest release, they managed to uh, add the the uh, per data point streaming. So this is on, on about 10 milliseconds that is actually processing every single data point. And then to, to uh, finish up before we jump into the example, with the machine learning side, you know, what about machine learning when it comes to data pipelines? Well, machine learning actually benefits a lot from the data pipeline ecosystem because that little uh, blob there is the machine learning code, the model that you built. And in order for you to put it in production, you know, there's all of these other things that are required for you to actually make it useful. So building your model is only the, the, the beginning of your journey to actually serving uh, uh, an actual product with, with the thing that you actually built. So, um, um, the data pipeline ecosystem has provided a lot of functionality for you to be able to monitor, serve, etc., for your machine learning. And the problem is that machine learning is also different. It doesn't just require uh, and introduce the complexities of data pipelines, which is basically just a job that takes data, does something, and puts it some, somewhere else. With uh, machine learning, the way that you do it is, you know, you take data, you, you add layers, and then it works. And of course, it's not like that. You actually have two stages that you follow. You have the training stage and the uh, uh, um, inference stage. And in this case, you know, you're basically saying that the same, the, the same job would behave differently with different data. And in, in, in essence, you have many more moving pieces to deal with. And in, 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 in that sense, the ETL job requires to add these complexities into the infrastructure. Um, what this actually looks like is for each of the steps to have, uh, to have the requirement to be abstracted, right? So you may have some machine learning code uh, that has some data coming in and then uh, some inference happening or some training happening and some data coming out. In order for you to be able to keep track of that machine learning step, you need both the, you need all the data coming in, the code configuration, and also the data out to validate it. Uh, because in that sense, you would be able to actually train it. And the complexity doesn't only end there, you also require the abstraction on all of the different uh, pieces that fall in your machine learning pipeline. So you may have some, uh, you know, data cleaning processes, you may have some um, tokenization processes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and you need to know what actually went into each of those things if you want to be able to reuse those models. So it actually introduces a lot of complexity. And uh, we actually have a talk specifically on this. You know, one, one slide doesn't you know, uh, give, give uh, uh, enough uh, context. But if you are interested in what are the tools that revolve around the, the machine learning productization, we have a massive list that includes things like explainability, privacy preserving machine learning, versioning of machine learning models that you can access uh, in the in the in the similar uh, git repo so it's bit.ly slash awesome mlops um, and if there's a tool that you uh, think is not there yet you know p please feel free to to add it and for the machine learning piece, what we're using is Spark ML, as we're already using Spark Streaming, as well as Spacey for the actual text processing. So now let's put everything together because you know there was a very, very broad overview. What are we going to do today? 
we're going to have a few components. There's the Reddit uh, 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 comments. We're going to have a Python worker that is going to be pushing stuff into our stream. Uh, we're going to have the Spark engine. And then we're going to visualize uh, our outputs on the an, an Elasticsearch database. So what it's actually going to look like is we're going to have a, a Python worker pulling the comments from Reddit and pushing them into a Kafka topic. The topic is called uh, Reddit underscore stream. Uh, uh, stream. What then we're going to have is a um, a worker in Spark that is going to be pulling and listening to that stream. Uh, for every single comment that arrives there, it's going to actually run it for, through the machine learning model. This machine learning model is going to predict whether it is uh, a hateful comment or not. And if uh, uh, it's going to then push the output of that into a topic for anyone to actually access it. And if it thinks that the comment is hateful, like if the actual prediction was positive, it's going to push it into uh, an alert stream topic. Um, at the end, we're just going to have a sync that is going to put everything in that alert into Elasticsearch. So we're going to jump into this. And uh, hopefully, nothing will break because we have so many moving pieces. And you know, in demos, nothing breaks ever. Uh, but what do we need to do uh, before that? Well, we need to actually build the machine learning model. And what that means is that we're going to be using uh, Apache Zeppelin as a front end. It's like Jupyter Notebooks to be able to interact with Spark ML. We're going to use some historical data. And we're going to train a machine learning model. Uh, we're going to teach it what looks like a hateful comment and what doesn't. You know, in, in our context, you know, we're not getting into the philosophical uh, meaning of what is hateful and what isn't, because uh, we, we wouldn't have time. And, uh, and we're going to, once we train it, we're going to persist that model. So yeah, we're going to take the same, same approach take some data, uh, transform that data into features, uh, train a machine learning model with those features, and then persist that model. More specifically, what it's going to look like for us, we're going to load some uh, Reddit historical data. We're going to clean that data and tokenize it with Spacey. Uh, we're going to convert the tokenized text into TFIDF vectors. Um, and then we're going to train a logistic regression model to basically say uh, whether it should be moderated or not. Uh, and once we're done, we're going to persist that model, and then we can actually use it in our real-time pipeline. So let's actually get started. The uh, setup that we have here is basically uh, all in a, a local uh, Docker um, uh, server. So this Docker Compose file uh, you know, is, is available online as well. So we have uh, two Kafka uh, workers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we're going to be using uh, this. This is currently already running. Uh, we're going to also be able to see the output of all of the streams. Uh, so this is the alert streams, the Reddit stream, and the processing stream. Um, and we're going to be using, first uh, of all, uh, the, the notebook to build uh, all of these things. So let's actually get started first with building the pipeline. So in, in here, what we're going to do is we're going to load that data set. We're going to limit the data to 100 because you know we don't have time to use the 200,000. So we're going to load it. Uh, and we're going to actually just uh, print it to see what, what does that look like. So here, there are uh, all the comments. So here it says, I've always been la 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 la. And whether it was removed, this wasn't removed. Uh, and then this other one, you know, Monday drug comp dot dot dot, it was removed, right? So that's the data set we're going to be using. So we take that data set, we can see that, you know, this is the breakdown on the actual data set, 140,000 were not removed, and then about 60,000 were removed. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to load Spacey. Uh, if anyone has actually had to use Spacey in Spark, you know that you need to actually use some uh, Spacey magic, as, as you can see here, which basically wraps it so that it doesn't have to initialize the object every single time. And we just wrap a, a Spacey tokenizer. So what this is going to do is going to take the actual text and it's going to transform it in to what would be a bunch of tokens, right? So what we see here, it says, I, I have al I've always been, transform it to pronoun, have, always, etc., etc. So it's an array of tokens. Um, what we can now do with those tokens is we can actually start having fun. Well, first, this is just a visualization of you know, how, uh, um, uh, how many tokens does each comment have. And we can see that most of them is on the 26th, uh, etc. Um, and what we're going to start doing is, is building those features, right? So so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to be building an IDF um, 
we're going to actually build an engram. So what that means is that we're going to take pairs of those words as opposed to just taking every single one of those. Um, and we're going to basically fit it. Oh, I just passed it. There we go. Um, and what you see here is that now, yeah, you have pairs uh, of n-grams from one to actually to five. Uh, we're going to use those n-grams for a count vectorizer. Uh, this basically counts, uh, gives you a frequency of the words. And now in our IDF inverse document frequency, now we have our uh, uh, TFIDF vectors that we can now split into our training and testing uh, 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 data set. Uh, and we can actually use that to train our logistic regression model. Um, in here, we basically just feed the training uh, data set, and we can evaluate it uh, to see how it performs. And it says here that it got 86% uh, accuracy, which with 100 examples, I mean, that means nothing at all. Um, but in essence, what we are able to do here is just, you know, get some visualizations of our model. We can see that, you know, the, the, the number of predicted that were expected predicted, you know, is a reasonable amount, et cetera, et cetera seeing things like RC curves. I'm not going to dive into mo uh, too much in the, in the machine learning side. But in essence, once we build our model, what you need to remember is that we basically just save it, right? So we followed our steps of creating a model. And when we're ready, we're happy with it, we persist that model. And we can now load this model and use it real in real time for evaluation of comments as they come one by one. And that's what we're actually going to be doing. So yeah. We're going to persist the model. And once we have it in production, new text is going to come in, transform it, uh, get a prediction, and then do the actions. And the actions that are, we're going to start with is creating a stream from Reddit comments. right? So let's actually jump into that. We can actually visualize um, everything. Uh, this is basically a front end called Kafka Manager. We can see the topics over here. So if I go on topic list, uh, we can see that there is the Reddit prediction stream, Reddit stream, uh, and Twitter stream from another talk. Um, but here we can see the metrics of the actual Kafka workers. Uh, this is just a Grafana listening to the to the JVM memory used, and we're going to see the spikes coming up. Right now, there's nothing running, um, but we can actually like start actually pushing stuff. And what we're going to uh, do this is we're going to simulate a stream. So we're going to first load our data set. Um, and we're going to start just pushing one row of that data set into our stream, right? And we should be able to see it in our, uh, in our, in our actual uh, streams over here. So this is just basically listening uh, to each of the streams. Um, we can see that in our data set, if we pick the first index, the first index, what it looks like, it says, you know, I've always th thought it emerged from Earth after an m -pace, la, 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 la. So it's basically like one row in our data set. And we're going to be pushing each of these rows into our, uh, our stream. And then we can see here uh, that, you know, we're now pushing in our stream uh, 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 all of the data that is coming in, right? So we have now a live stream of Reddit comments, uh, hopefully most of them, you know, very positive. Uh, but if there's any negative, we'll catch them. The next step is to actually uh, listen to this stream and perform some inference using the model that we just trained, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to load this model that we just trained, um, and we're going to use that. And the, the way that we're going to use that is we can see here, uh, over there, uh, we can actually use this model. So we're actually running a string through this model. So if we do pipeline uh, model dot transform, and we give it this string that we just wrote. My coworkers couldn't even write a simple message in our communication, right? And it says here that the prediction is, um, well, it, it should be that it actually like uh, predicted as, as, as positive. So this one, it says it should be removed. So it would be flagged, this specific example. right? So what we're going to do now is we're going to start our streaming context. So this is basically what says, I want you to listen every um, you know, two, two, two seconds. Uh, and now I'm going to be uh, uh, listening uh, to that. And we should be able to see uh, the next stream here. So here you can see the, the tokenized uh, uh, um, uh, token. Uh, 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 pieces here. And then anything that should be alerted, you can see it over here. But um, uh, I didn't mention a disclaimer. Some of this may be a little bit offensive. So um, you know, don't get angry with me. Get angry with Reddit. Um, so now what we should have is uh, a stream that is actually being pushed into um, back into our Kafka with both the processed uh, uh, predictions as well as the um, alerts. 
So in real time, we're, 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 we're seeing a stream. It's being processed with an inference. We're pushing all the results. And also, if there's anything that should be alerted, we actually send it for the alert topic. So now for the last part, what we're going to do is we're going to actually add uh, this point into Elasticsearch. And here we see that Elasticsearch uh, currently has uh, uh, this, this stuff, which I need to actually stop because uh, uh, it seems that it's, it's, it's listening. Um, but yeah, basically what it would do is, as soon as I run this, I am sending each of the topics from the uh, Reddit prediction stream into our Elasticsearch uh, database, right? And what we now have here is we have our uh, uh, Kibana dashboard that shows us in real time all of the comments that are coming in so that maybe our analysts can now uh, process some uh, analytics in real time. Right, and here you can actually do filtering by the ones that, you know, for example, uh, it predicted as removed. Uh, so if we add here, uh, this is like, you know, prediction one. Uh, uh, and some of them, you know, they, they are false positives. Uh, 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 but then others are, you know, clearly things that should be removed. Um, and with that, I am extremely happy that it actually all worked out, so we're, we're, we're good so far. So with, with that said, so today we dived into a very, very high conceptual level intro to ETL as well as streaming. Uh, we covered some machine learning fundamentals as well as trade-off with some of the tools. Uh, you know, of course, this is uh, 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 just a sample and a taster of what is possible to do with all of uh, these different technologies. One of the things that I would really encourage you to do is to jump online and uh, run this and then try different potential streams. You can actually uh, 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 register in Twitter to get like an API key, and it's free to get a real stream of, of tweets. So for example, we have a real time uh, tweet stream of like all the Brexit tweets to do some real time analysis. So I mean, I don't recommend that because there's too much hate on that. But um, if you want to actually jump into uh, uh, some of the newest technology, you know, you have all that in the palm of your hands. So I really, really encourage you uh, to jump into that. Um, and again, you can find uh, the slides for this uh, for this talk here, as well as the repo with uh, the Docker Compose and all of the uh, um, uh, examples uh, in in this repo. Um, so, with that said, uh, I hope you enjoyed this talk. Uh, you know, if, if you have any questions, I can answer them now, or otherwise, I'll be around uh, for the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.